even though we are concentrating on Jeremiah this week, I wanted to bring in some comments on Ezekiel because part of looking at Jeremiah is looking at the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem and the fact that many of the people are going into exile. And Ezekiel is one who speaks from, Israel, from exile. He is one who was taken from Jerusalem in 598, and he is living among exiles in Babylon. The loss of Jerusalem and the temple was absolutely catastrophic for Judah, and it's more than most of us can imagine. In terms of the loss of the temple, we really have no equivalent. The, the destruction of any given church can be shattering, but for people living in Judah, the temple was the place, the place, where God's presence dwelt among them. It was the place God had chosen for his name to dwell. For Christians, no church has quite that significance. In addition, there is being taken away forcefully from one's land, having that land destroyed. And some of us may have experienced something like this. I certainly have not. But for those who were in Judah, this was pretty much a feeling like the world had ended. But Ezekiel endures the exile and he helps the people rebuild their identity despite the destruction of Jerusalem and the reality of exile. He was taken in 598, as we already mentioned, in the first major deportation because he was a priest and thus among the leadership. And estimates are about 5,000 people who were deported at this time. He is a prophet at least until 571 BCE. That's the last time we can really date anything. He is not able to function as a priest because the temple is destroyed, but he still is aware of the temple in his vision and most importantly in his vision of the new temple, what in his eyes would be the third temple. There are three major themes in the book. There is the continued presence of God among his people, including the reasons for God's withdrawal and conditions for his reappearance. Another theme is the moral responsibility for the failures of Israel and the nature of legitimacy of religious and political leadership in Judah and in the restored community. The timeline is something like this. Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Jerusalem in 598. King Jehoiakim died. Jehoiakim became king. And there is the first deportation of Judean refugees. And there is the beginning of Zedekiah's reign. In 593, a few years after that deportation, God calls Ezekiel to be a prophet in the throne chariot vision. 587 or five to 586, there is the destruction of Jerusalem and the second deportation of Judeans to Babylonia. And in 571, the last dated message of Ezekiel. So he's roughly contemporary to a lot of what is going on with Jeremiah. Chapters 1 through 24 contain visions and prophecies between 593 and 587, much of them written in the first person. 
and his call to become a prophet is given in a throne chariot vision. This is something, we see something similar to this in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah 6. As I looked, a stormy wind came out of the north, a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually, and in the middle of the fire, something like gleaming amber. In the middle of it was something like four living creatures. This was their appearance. They were of human form. And there's more description there. And skipping to verse 10, as for the appearance of their faces, the four had the face of a human being, the face of a lion on the right side, the face of an ox on the left side, and the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another, while two covered their bodies. Just as a side note, there is a similar description in Revelation 4, 6 through 8. And it is from these passages that Christian tradition derives the symbols for the four gospel writers. And if you are in more traditional churches or if you look at certain icons, such as this Orthodox icon, Matthew is symbolized by a man, Mark by a winged lion on the right, Luke by a winged ox on the left, and John by a rising eagle. So this symbolism continues down to the present time. This vision is what we call a theophany, an experience of the presence of God. And there is similar language from Exodus 24, 1 Kings 19, Isaiah 6, and some of the Psalms, for example, Psalm 18. These are not meant to be taken literally because they, to describe them is beyond human power. And Ezekiel himself struggles to describe this. And he, he likens it to the glory of God. This seems to be a version or depiction of the Ark of the Covenant, which is borne by special cherubim of the Divine Council. This vision in later Judaism gives rise to a form of mysticism called Merkava mysticism. Merkava is a chariot. And underage men, which means men under 40, were not allowed to read an account of it. It was considered so powerful. This vision signifies that Yahweh has come to Babylon. In other words, he's appearing to Ezekiel not in the temple as in Isaiah 6 to commission Ezekiel to be a prophetic voice in exile, a watchman or a sentinel warning the people. And as a prophet, he is handed a scroll with words of woe, which he is to eat. Chapters 4 through 7 have a number of symbolic acts. One thing that Ezekiel does is he makes a clay model of the city of Jerusalem and he enacts the siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. He lays on the ground to symbolize the captivity of Israel and Judah, eating only a very small amount of food. He shaves his head and disposes of it to illustrate what would happen to Jerusalem, burning, striking with a sword, scattering. And he announces the coming destruction. This is before the actual destruction, between 593 and 587. And in a vision that is dated to 592 BCE, 
he is transported back to Jerusalem and witnesses the worship of foreign gods there. And in the vision, he sees Yahweh leaving the temple and Jerusalem because of the corruption of the temple. Then the glory of the Lord went out from the threshold of the house and stopped above the cherubim. The cherubim lifted up their wings and rose up from the earth in my sight as they went out with the wheels beside them. They stopped at the entrance of the east gate of the house of the Lord, and the glory of the Lord, of the glory of the God of Israel was above them. Then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. And the glory of the Lord ascended from the middle of the city and stopped on the mountain east of the city. So the glory of the Lord has lifted up above the city and is on a mountain east of it. There are further symbolic acts and metaphors in chapters 12 through 24. Ezekiel enacts the coming fall of Jerusalem by packing his bags and digging through a wall, hurrying away to escape. Jerusalem is compared to an unfruitful vine, good only for the fire. In chapter 16, Israel is portrayed as an unfaithful wife who is eventually restored. And chapter 17 uses images of eagles, trees, and vines to depict the uprooting of Judah. <music>